talk now. Testing, testing, testing. Mic check, mic check. Can people hello, hello. hear Adam in the stream? Yep. <gasps> Perfectly. That's so great. Thank God. Otherwise, I was going to be screwed. <laughs> Well, there's a two, three second delay, but yeah. Well, you guys are live, so whatever you say, it's coming through. All right, we're going live in 30 seconds. We're running out of time. <laughs> it's me. Hi, everyone. We're doing some book chat here, which is going to be super exciting. My name is Maud Garrett, and I am the creator of Geek Bomb. And Geek Bomb's Discord is where we have the home for all of the book club conversations. Now, this particular week we're doing... Six Crows by Lee Bardugo. So I've got show notes here, but I also have the Discord chat. So you guys in the Discord can talk along if you want to uh, only type, but we also have everyone calling in. So everyone unmute and say hi real quick. Hello. There's one. That Hello. was Jimmy. Hello. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hello. Hello. How cool is that? So what's going to be really hard for um, everyone who is in the Discord is that you can't really watch along live, but you do get to hear it live. So we're going to have to get you to, what was the whole rule with that one, Adam? Mute the stream, but have Discord open. So you're going to see a little bit of a delay, but we've got the whole thing going. <gasps> That's super exciting. And we also have comments that are coming through here. I'm so excited to hear your impressions of Six of Crows. A big hello, hello. <laughs> Are you are you not in the chat? Oh wait a second. Do we not have do we not have you in the call? Are you just gonna type along? That's okay too. Shiver Brain says, What's up? Ivari says, Look, I haven't finished Six of Crows yet, so I'm just gonna lurk with the sound off so I don't get any spoilers. Loving that. Fat Black Patrick Swayze says, I'm just here for burger talk. <laughs> I don't get okay, yeah, well, that'll be interesting. Um Nick Swings meow both in the comments and in the call there. There you are, Lisa. Say hi, Lisa. Hello, hello. Yay. So we're literally doing a virtual book club now. So previously um, with Nerdist, we had Rachel Hine, Hector Navarro, and myself in a sort of like three-way conversation where we would talk about our thoughts in very, um, you know, a lot of detail uh, and then we would head over to the Discord afterwards to have a discussion and a bit of a QA. and a um, But now that Nerdist is going down to once a month, I thought it would be really cool to be able to not only do it here but invite the Discord into the stream so that we can kind of have a little bit more of a public book club um, and then everyone in the Discord is able to kind of be in that virtual room and have the discussion about the book. So let's chat a little bit about Six of Crows. I'm, like, trying to also do all the tech stuff as well, so bear with me. We're talking about Six of Crows. If you have uh, seen Shadow and Bone, you know who we're talking about. I watched, uh, uh, I only read Shadow and Bone, watched the show, read Six of Crows. So I'm asking everyone in the voice chat, what order did you do it as well? Um, and I'm going to go down alphabetical order. So we're talking about the, mo uh, the show, Reading Shadow and Bone, Reading Six of Crows, and what the order was. Uh, Adam, your turn. Uh, I'm, I am out. I'm just listening. Uh, oh. just, just moderating here. We're just moderating. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yep. Can do. Avery. Uh, I read the um, Shadow and Bone trilogy, watched the show, and I'm now reading Six of Crows. Exactly the same. Okay. Aaron. 
Aaron only just finished um, reading the book like moments before this book club went live, by the way. You there, Aaron? He's on a work call. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. Hey. Oh, you're there? What order did I, you? I am. What's the order? Uh, books first, the, the Shadow and Bones books first, then the show, and now Six of Crows. I feel like everyone's in the same boat. Okay, speak up if that wasn't your order. Wasn't mine. Okay, Kate and then Kat, what was your order? Uh, I read Shadow and Bone, the first one in the series first, and then I read Six of Crows, and then I read Siege and Shadow and Rise and Ruin, and then I watched the show, and then I read Six of Crows again. <laughs> okay, I like that. Uh, Kat, what was yours? I read Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom last year, and then I read Shadow and Bone series this year with Book Club, and then I read... Uh, the other two books in the uh, Grimish verse. Okay. So I don't know about you, but I kind of wish I'd read Six of Crows before I watched Shadow and Bone. I think it's a really interesting move to uh, integrate both of the series because they are in the in the Grisha verse, but they're also in different timelines in that Grisha verse. So it was kind of like a what would the crows have done in that moment uh, in the sort of like the Shadow and Bone story and how do we make that work. The good thing was like Shadow and Bone, now that I've read half of Six of Crows, needed that sort of depth behind it because you get really interesting supporting characters. Um, what I didn't like about it is that I had, when I was watching the show, I knew all of one story, but I had no idea who the other people were. So I really did wish that I watched uh, Shadow and Bone first. What's the chat saying? This is a little small for my eyes. Uh, Aaron said, I'm glad I watched the show to get a visual aid on what they look and act like, although Kaz was toned way down in the show. Chris says, I read the first Shadow and Bone and then just followed along with Book Club um, while, reading, while reading a lot of sci-fi. Um, and then Nix agrees. Yeah, Kaz definitely toned down that oyster knife. Uh, so I'm going to get stuck into the conversations here. Um, I've managed, where is it though? Here it is. I've managed to have a little bit of a rundown. What? You guys can see <laughs> my notes here. <laughs> oh, she's doing work. So basically the synopsis is Ketterdam, a bustling hub of international trade where anything can be had for the right price. And no one knows that better than criminal prodigy Kaz Brecker. Kaz is offered a chance at a deadly heist that could make him rich beyond his wildest dreams, but he can't pull it off alone. A convict with a thirst for revenge, a sharpshooter who can't walk away from a wager, a runaway with a privileged past, a spy known as the Wraith, a heart render using her magic to survive the slums, a thief with a gift for unlikely escapes. Six dangerous outcasts, one impossible heist. Kaz's crew is the only thing that might stand between the world and destruction. If they don't kill each other first. That is probably like the best sort of explanation of any book. And I feel like, and I wonder if we could do a poll about this, like, do you think that this feels like a TTRPG kind of thing where you have a ragtag bunch with really unique skill sets um, that have to play within the group dynamic, but also has their own backstory that shapes the character. I love this. I think that these characters are so much more interesting. One of the big gripes that I had about Shadow and Bone was that it just felt a little surface level quite a lot of the time, whereas the first half of this book, getting six different perspectives and, in, and backstory interwoven in it, I am here for it. So I want to open up that conversation first in Best Dressed. Did you prefer the way that this book was written from third-person perspective, from everyone's perspective, or were you more of a fan of Shadow and Bone where we're focusing on the one protagonist in first person so you see it completely through her lens? Who wants to go? This ain't a time to be shy. Um, I would like to go. Yeah. So I like the uh, third person more. Because it gives you a, a wider perspective and it explains better, in my opinion. You know, like it's not like not everything is about Alana and Mal to me. It's just like I want to know like the whole entire world. I want to know how things function and stuff. And, and obviously, you know, 
is good that way. Okay, third person. Yep. Jay Buntrock says, I like Six of Crows a lot better. Lisa says, I like third person more. Definitely prefer getting multiple perspectives. Are we all in that same boat? Speak yeah. up. Oh, yes. Cat and then yeah, Nix. I really preferred that um, you get to see sort of everybody's whole um, thought process and how they feel about each other. And they're all so different. There's so much more depth into the story uh, this way. And the way it was written, too, where it's going between the different characters and you're leaving off on one character chapter on not quite a cliffhanger, but something that you want to see what happens next um, is what kept me reading a lot of these books. Yeah, agree. Uh, Nix, you were going next. Yeah, I really like how the pacing also with the switching characters fits with the story really well, too. Like when they're having the quick paced fight at the docks when the ship explodes it's switching between them a lot quicker and it's having these short like 10 minute chapters and then once we get to the boat and they're on this journey then it's these longer chapters where we're getting to see how they're acting in these down times and we're getting more backstory and i just thought that change of pacing was really nice I absolutely agree, and I was just thinking then how much more interesting it would have been during those longer sort of like drawn-out moments of travel. So when you had Alina and Mal kind of on the run in the first book, when you had the ensemble going underground uh, in the third book, even Nikolai's perspective would have been so refreshing to kind of like have more of a sense of her choice, her understanding. Getting in the brain of the Darkling would have been interesting, but I think a lot of his, like even if that's even if that was only saved for like the last chapter of the books or whatever it was, there is so much more potential there. And I know that Lee Badu, uh, Badugo has gone on record to say, I learned a lot about writing that first book and there's a lot of things I would have done differently. Um uh, Kate says, I feel like it's almost unfair to compare Shadow and Bone to uh, Six of Crows in terms of a novel. We saw Badugo's growth as a writer even between Shadow and Bone and Ruin and Rising. There it is, yeah. So, I mean, the potential's there, but what she's done really brilliantly is world building, even though, as Jimmy mentioned earlier, the first book was really focusing around Alina and main, like Anne Mao's sort of like view. We did get a sense of what the corporal Nai and the ethereal Kai, sorry, corporal Kai, ethereal Kai, um, uh, all of the sort of the Grisha, the little palace. We really had a, an established sense of this Grisha verse. The genre completely flipped in this book, and I loved it. You know, she could have continued the path of like you know, Grisha, what do you do with the power, the political war and the scope that was going on. But for me, they used that main part of the Grisha, Grisha, sorry, um, but then that first chapter, Jost, where it's just like, you know, that was a little bit hard for me when I first listened to the first chapter. I was like, what's happening? I don't really understand because you're throwing me back, yes, into the world, but like in a very different way part of it and a different time of it um but then when you realize that it's basically about sort of like how a drug has been tailored to create superhumans where have we just seen that guys this is steampunk meets falcon and winter soldier <laughs> like so cool uh and what i love as well is that these grisha powers were sort of like you know pretty cool because they had a superhuman-esque ability and they were living a lot longer but i loved her take in the what if side of this and that is what if they created this thing called uh the and i have it in my show notes because it took me a while to get it jerda jerda uh, parem so Jerda was obviously like a stimulant and then they tailored with the stimulant uh, to make it Jerda Parem, which is kind of like, yeah, this super soldier serum. And it's so interesting to see what it would do to the Grisha's power. And we got a glimpse in that first chapter of just how sort of like enhanced their powers could become. Uh, and then, you know, the fact that they had a tide maker and they had a fabricator who was able to turn iron into gold, the tide maker who was able to walk through freaking walls. And then now you had this healer and they thought that since a healer healed and the demeanor isn't chaotic and disruptive, that this would be the safest bet. And of course we found out uh, with Anya that uh, the Grisha that were then able to 
get inside the head and become full on Charles Xavier and make people do uh, her bidding. Um, and I think that even that chapter where Kaz, who's trying to be sold on this deal, which is the basis of the story, sees the soldiers because she commanded them to wait. And their whole body and being is in a constant state of waiting and anticipation, but they aren't able to do anything else. So they're like good as dead inside. And it's like, this is so scary. This kind of power is so dangerous. And the fact that there's so many different types of Grisha that have this world changing uh, access to power now, you really get a sense of the threat. Uh, is this a YA book? Because some of the themes are like pretty gnarly. Um, the first question I want to ask everyone as well is what did you think about this genre flip? What did you think about the introduction, the whole Jerda Perem, like the fact that we're changing the drugs and we're changing the scope of the story? What did you think of that? Who wants to go? Flash a mic. Aaron. Oh, first. Yay. Uh, I was just going to type it, but I'll, I'll speak. Uh, I kind of like the fact that it feels like it's Gangs of New York meets Ocean's Eleven. Yes. Kind of feel, if that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. I but, get the... But, but in, in like the universe of Avatar with a steampunk theme. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's so funny. I will give it credit because like Grisha basically being able to kind of manipulate the elements with your Tide Makers and your, your, the Fire Grisha and you know, the Infernies. Inferno? Infernies? Infernos? Infernies. Inferno? I don't know. Somebody else could probably know more than I do. I was like, yeah, they're not really getting the whole earth bending, are they? Until now, until this book. So interesting. Um, yeah, they had the one guy when they're like, at the place finally and they start lifting up rocks yeah <laughs> insane oh my gosh they're like super saiyan um kate is saying i love that part of it because it's the same sort of thing as alina's power with light sometimes the more subtle and less flashy powers i mean sunlight's flashy but not in the same way as creating infernos or tidal waves can be the most deadly super interesting um, and Kate was just like, I read this book after I read The Lies of Loch Lamora, so I thought Six of Crows is like a teenage Loch Lamora, and I was totally okay with it. I would love to take this time to recommend Lies of Loch Lamora. It's a fantastic book where I have it right here. Oh, I got my shot a couple of days ago, so my arm's a little tender. Um, but, yeah, sort of like a steampunk version or a fantasy version of Heist, so amazing. And I think the best part about it is that you get to learn every single character, their skill set, their strength, and their weakness. And this is kind of like a functions and flagons thing, and this is how I build out campaigns. So I love this side of it. And I love also seeing the dynamic between the six of them because they are so uniquely um skilled and they have very strong personalities and some of them are going to butt, some of them are going to, um, you know, do a little bit of ooh, ooh, romance. Some of them are going to do both of those. Uh, and that's what's really, really interesting about all of this. Um, so, yes, that was the that part of the conversation about being thrown into it all. Um, I didn't really talk about Lee Bardugo. Do we want to know about Lee Bardugo? Born in 1975 in Israel. I didn't know that. She lives in Hollywood. Oh, Lee, get Get, what are you doing? Get over here. Get, get over here. That's really interesting. Rachel, we should have gotten onto that. Um, the book only came out in 2015, um, but she'd written, obviously, the Grisha trilogy before that with Shadow and Bone in 2012, Siege and Storm in 2013, and Ruin and Rising in 2014. Get out. 2012, 2013, 2014, and then this one in 2015, and then I'm guessing the next one. A book a year? Oh, that's really well done and getting better as well. That's so cute. Cool. year is common in YA. Is that right? Yeah, it's the thing in children. Because YA is still considered children's literature in terms of, like, marketing and, like, publishing. So a book a year is pretty common for young books because of, like, the attention span of children and your audience aging out of your books. Ugh. So if you constantly are putting out new books you're retaining more of your audience, right? Wowie. Hey, if anyone has fun facts like that, feel free to jump in because that makes this stream so much better. I liked this question before from Jay Mondo who said, never read the book and the show was quite bad at explaining anything going on like the politics, et cetera, or laws of magic in the world. Uh, chat, book clubbers, do we agree, disagree with that sentiment? I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me why. It's really, 
Um, it's really hard for me to. I'm sorry, you go. No, go, cat. You're up. I was just going to say it's really hard for me to gauge it or say for sure because um, because I did read the books first and I, I understood what was going on, but I had my husband watching with me who hadn't read the books. And he, he seemed to be able to, to kind of understand everything that was happening, um, but I don't know if he had the, the deeper understanding that those who have read the books got. Okay, I agree with that. Who else said that they agree with the statement? I did. Why is that, Jimmy? Uh, well, I agree with the statement because, like you said, um, like she said before, it's a different perspective. So, you know, the book kind of like leans it out to you and is like, this is this and this is that. And this is, it walks you through it. Meanwhile, the TV show is just like, here you are. Hope you enjoy it. There's a lot of beautiful people and a lot of uh, dazzling effects. You know, so that's why I agree with it. I'm going to be very mindful that Michelle hasn't watched all the show yet, so no spoilers there. And because we are live on Twitch, I do want to do a couple of shout-outs. STS just subscribed for their ninth month, which is amazing. Clever Girl followed along. A big hello to you. Um, Aaron, you subscribed at seven months, and you quickly wrote, I made it. Whew. And then Zilla Nux, thank you so much for the follow as well. I was wondering why this chat's so quiet. It's Patreon only. Lol. No, it's not. Done right. Oh, the chat and the conversation is Patreon only, but the actual written chat, that's everyone. But if you want to be in this chat, then that is Patreon only as well. And you can see all the lovely names of everyone in here as well and what everyone is writing. We are talking Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. We're talking about the first half of the first book, part one to part three. So let's start meeting. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do, Nightbot. I wanted to refresh. So let's start talking about our wonderful characters, which I love so much. I'm the same, Michelle. I don't mind spoilers either. So whatever. It's just, yeah. It's When you watch it, you get its version of it. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about the characters. We'll start off with our main man, Kaz. Kaz Brecker. Um, he, I want to like with each of the characters, I'm kind of going to get like a little bit of a profile. So we're talking their skill, their strength and their weakness or like their weakness and their individual motivation, and then talk about their backstory and then their interrelationships with everyone else. Um, so we're going to get our cares on basically what is his skill set? He's a mastermind. He's a criminal mastermind. He's a thief that got arrested when he was 13. He's now 17 and he hasn't been arrested since. But in that time, he has done a lot of legwork in Ketterdam and he's basically like the right-hand man of the guy who runs the town, uh, apart from Pekka Rollins, which we will talk about. Um, so Kaz, he's just brilliant. What's really interesting, we haven't learned about his leg or why his leg is sore, but that is his weakness so he strengthens his brain he can pull all things together he's got a plan b c d e f g and he knows how to manipulate information he uses information as currency he knows how to build out a team there was a great quote in there and i want everyone to kind of think of your quotes that you like too but there's a really great great quote where he's like i didn't need the best team i needed my good good people that i could make great and i was like ah i love that that's kind of what i do at geek bomb as well it's like i want my team and i want to make i'll help make them great so I kind of get that. Um, his individual motivation, I mean, this dude got burnt. He sold the farm with his brother and then he found out that the world kind of sucks the hard way. Um, his brother died, Pekka Rollins had killed him and we kind of learn more and more about his backstory um, because of his vulnerability towards Inej. Is Inej his weakness? He seems to think so. I don't. Um, so I want to talk about what you think of Kaz Brecker, if anyone wants to jump on to chat about that. But the big question that I want to ask everyone and in the chat and hashtag reading as well, or in the comments, if you've read the book, big thing I want to ask is, do you think that the Six of Crows would be a lot different if Kaz led with appreciation? So who wants to chat about Kaz as a character? No. Kaz is my favorite character. I love, I love him. Uh, like, I just love his energy. Like, um, maybe it's because um, I associated with the trauma that he uh, suffered as a child. 
because uh, because of that he had ha hepidemic phobia or hepa I, I'm terrible at saying it, but I just love how like he he he's a grump, but he has a very positive energy to him. Like he's always motivating the group in a way that works. You know what I mean? Like if you were to, to hold your group's hand, you wouldn't get the best effort out of them because you'd be coddling them. So he's kind of like the papa bear being like, hey, you know, I'll help you out. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. But he does it like in a secretive way. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I like that. Nox, I saw you on mute. What's your take on Kaz? I think if Kaz was any different, this would be an entirely different story. I mean, this, the force of his personality, whatever makes it up, is what carries the crew through their adventures or misadventures, as you might call them. Kate, do you want to jump on and tell me the comment that you just wrote? Because that's brilliant. You want me to just read it? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the Six of Crows could exist without him being dirty hands. Like, they would be circling the drain of the barrel as lowly members of another gang. Another gang. I'm, I'm a great gang there. <laughs> but with Kaz being willing to do the dirty work is how they exist in the first place. Like, they would be part of, like, Pekka Rollins' gang without mm. Kaz. And they would, or... I know she would be part of the menagerie still. I actually... But he needed to be hard for them to exist. Uh, I really like the the fact that you are using sort of like his reputation, dirty hands, like he's an enigma in that way. Uh, and I sort of love that. Like rumours, pick one. What, whatever you've heard, just pick one and, yeah, that'll, that'll be it. That's it. And that moment where, again, in front of Inej, he removes his gloves and you just see that they're fine. He's got a bit of a knotted scar from like, you know, a fight that he got into when he was younger, but he's using his reputation as being ruthless and brutal. And this is a little bit like what we saw in Shadow and Bone with the Darkling. Make me your villain, you know. I like with um, Kaz, it's like it's not all an act. Like obviously he's not always as much of a, you know, sociopath as he has this like front as the head of their gang, the drags, but he's not nice, you know what I mean? Like it's not... There is a part of him that is hard and black because of his desire for revenge. Kitty has something to say. <laughs> uh, Nix, I saw that you unmuted. Have you got something? Yeah, sort of like to bounce off of that. A lot of them wouldn't be a part of the dregs. A lot of them would maybe even be dead. Because like Nina almost joined Peck Rollins' crew and it was just, and it talks about how uh, someone working for Pekka Rollins like died the next day in the same role that she would have like been in or like in the next week. And so clearly she didn't have proper protection if she had joined Pekka Rollins. Uh, yeah. I hear that. Um, Michelle brings up a great point as well. Michelle, are you there? Do you want to read out your comment? I like this. Oh, sure. Um, I said leading with appreciation and positivity would turn this into Ocean's Eleven, the YA fantasy. Um, but Kaz being who he is uh, makes it more gentleman bastards, which are the, the lies of Lockamora books. Just and I think different the tones, same genre plot, but or same plotting, but. Mm, totally different books or totally different stories the biggest this is me having an epiphany the biggest difference between your oceans 11 and your gentleman bastards and what's happening with six of crows and why one is led by appreciation and support and positivity and the other one is led by fear um, manipulation of information is privilege Ocean's Eleven are skilled and they don't need the job, but it would be kind of nice. You know, they're not short on money. They're not desperate. You know, they're not fighting for their lives. Whereas both uh, Gentleman's ba Gentleman Bastards and Six of Crows, they're on the street. They are criminals. They are rock bottom. They had, you know, they were on the street since they were kids. So this is a band together, find your people but never trust everyone. And I think this is a very similar theme in Mistborn as well by Brandon Sanderson with the scar is that they are so oppressed and they are so pushed down and they are like, you know, the scum of whatever place that they're in and that they're never seen that, you know, you're not going to get the love. You're not going to get that, you know, loving bond and nurture. It just doesn't exist in their lives. Um, the crows know poverty. Yeah, no one, nobody in Ocean's Eleven knew poverty. Uh, po po poverty sorry. Um, 
I like the cat said that Kaz is a flawed character whose flaws don't just disappear because now he's a main character. Does anyone want to um, weigh in on Kaz's sort of like anti-nurturing nature and how that makes him a good or not necessarily good leader in this instance? Because like for me, just I understand how he has to sort of like um, keep information away from people and that they are sort of in a way blindly loyal to him, but he does keep delivering and looking after them in particular ways. But, like, positive reinforcement goes such a long way and it's, like, if you really truly want to build and have trust and people dying for you, like, I know that sounds, you know, a little bit extreme, but it's, like, they're going into life and death situations and we see so many times torturing for information, you know, changing sides. You want someone that's really going to have your back and that doesn't necessarily exist, does it? So does anyone want to weigh in on this? Yes. Um, I, I think that um, the idea that he's he's so tough actually helps his game because they know they can count on him. He's not going to let emotions cloud him, um, cloud his judgment. He's going to be razor focused on the job and on his particular goal. Um, but he doesn't let his crew down because he needs them. This is a great, great sort of like uh, start into the conversation that we're having over in the chat and I can pull it up here if everyone wants to have a squiz at it. Thank you, Keeper of Ancient Wisdom. Uh, that whole thing is he needs his crew. It's not a, necessarily a want, maybe a little bit with Inej, um, but need. And it's is it because they are people or he likes their skill set or because they are an asset? And we're talking about that. Jay Bundrock. Jay, do you want to have a chat about that? You asked the question, does he love Inej uh, or is she just that valuable an asset? Do you want to have a chat about that, Jay Bundrock? Hello. Hey, you're on. What's up? Hey, this is James. Hi, James. Katie, Katie, Katie didn't read the books. Or she's not here. Oh, they're so good, though. We'll get her for the next one, maybe. Uh, yeah, I just think of how powerful his emotions are in the, when uh, Inez is hurt and he needs to get her saved. So he's, he's, he's uh, you know, kicking everyone out of the way, including Jesper, to get to, to Nina so he can save Inez. So you wonder how much he cares for her as a person or if she's just that valuable to him as the rate. 100% because the key component of this plan is that she has to climb up six stories through a an incineration shaft kind of deal. And no one else in the crew can do that but her. So that's the thing. Is he so frazzled because he needs her in the plan or because he has feelings for her? There was a really sweet moment where they're having a conversation and you hear his inner dialogue. And she's like, why are you doing this? What do you want? And he's like, you, Inej. And he's like, I just need the job done. And it's this absolute detachment to any kind of feelings. And I wonder, I don't know if anyone wants to keep weighing in on this, but he truly sees having any sort of affection is a weakness. But do you see this as a vulnerability? Do you see it as a weakness? Do you see it as something that should be explored? What do you think about Kaz's weakness and lack of vulnerability? Who's up? Nix. Um, I... As you were talking, I was comparing it to the relationship that Nikolai and Alina had, where there was definitely, like, a political gain there. And I think we can compare the politicalness of a prince to also a gang leader, because the prince was, as Prince Nikolai was trying to get the support to take throne from his older brother, and here he has to get this crew to believe in him, trust in him, put their life in him. Um... And so it's that sort of game, too. I think that's also why he was so hesitant to go to an edge, not just because he saw it as a weakness to, like, care about her, but he also wanted the others to not see that he was worried. He <laughs> Uh, 
I love that you made that point because this is a lot of the time where he struggles with words. What he's thinking and what he's saying are often very different in terms of like, you know, showing vulnerability and what's really going on in his soft little heart. But the the actions often will speak louder. But us women, a lot of the time, and I apologize for the stereotype, we need to hear it. We need to know what it truly is so there's no wiggle room because sometimes an action has light and shade. Sometimes it's just trying to be nice. Sometimes it's backed by, you know, motivation. We just want to know with that. Uh, Kate, I want to grab you on because I, the whole comment about like, if we're talking about them as real life r slash relationship posts, can we just talk about this for a second? Can you jump on and talk me through that um, line of comment? Oh, just if you're one of the people who just likes to read like our relationships or our am i the asshole subreddits just this would totally be the male 40 with girlfriend 19 post where it's just he's such a controlling narcissistic unfeeling like asshole and all the comments would be like break up with him throw this man away if this was real life i would just, love to read that post as well cat uh, male 17 about woman 16 <laughs> Am I the asshole? So I got a group together because we kind of need to save the world. And she was working in a brothel, so I kind of saved her from that. So that's a good thing, right? But at the same time, I have feelings for her, but I'll never tell her that and I'll never show affection and I'll make her question her worth every single day. And I'm going to just call her an asset. So I'm basically going to objectify her completely to like the bottom line of what existence means. But at the end of the day, she's getting paid. So am I the asshole? toxic but like I said in a one up here where it's he never wanted to be weak again so he honed himself into something so sharp that he could never be soft again this is a form of uh this is a coping mechanism and I kind of went through this a little bit as well to get a bit personal and that's if you, if you get so hurt you want to do anything to make sure that that doesn't happen again and a lot of the time that's keeping people at arm's distance that's not letting people in it's not sharing your emotions it's not sharing your vulnerability and even though you don't get hurt, you don't really let anyone in. So it's a very isolating and lonely experience. And I feel like at the end of the day, Kaz truly can only rely on himself. And he understands that. Um, and just to hear kind of like Jesper and Inez just question going, dude, you just kept more information. Why couldn't you tell me that? Why can't you just tell me some of the plan? Why don't you trust me enough? Um, and it's just making sure that Kaz has absolute control all the time. Um so, yeah, I think that that's really fascinating with Kaz. Do I think that it's helpful in his position? Not really. Aaron, I really like your comment. Do you want to jump in and talk about it? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the one where he's like pure intellect, that comment? Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like following up on uh, Kat's comment about the crew feels like the opposite of having that one person who is the heart. Everyone in the crows is the heart except Kaz. I'm saying he's kind of the pure intellect he's just cold logic and reason but based on like how he sometimes acts especially like you know the guy on the boat where he cuts his that was so that was a lot i was walking actually this is a great story i was on a hike with zelda and this dog keeps coming up to chat with zelda and it's all cool and it's cara delavine <laughs> and i'm like oh sub girl <laughs> okay um she thinks that zelda's a really cute name because i was like come on zelda and she's like zelda what a great name for a dog and i'm like yeah i know yes yes thank you but like while that's happening because i hike with my book in my ear and it's like kaz brecker decided to grab his knife out and slice up and then do another slice as an x and then used his gloved fingers to pluck his eyeball out and so i'm like trying to half talk to kara but then also being like Ugh. oh god oh my god this is so violent and brutal what the hell <laughs> which kind of like like 99% of the time, he is just pure cold logic. He only uses emotions just to like, you know, feed his desire to succeed and just, you know, you know, purely for like the monetary, you know, pursuits and things like that. But he doesn't let it rule, rule him. He rules it unless he, you know, gets one of his assets, you know, stabbed and, you know, dying. Now he's going to pluck your eyeballs out, I guess. But this is the thing again. Did he have that sort of insane, like psychosis reaction because it's an edge? Right. Would he feel that way with anybody else? I think he even like said something like that in the book, if I remember 
right? And this is this also thing where Inej is like, Jasper, uh, Jasper, sorry, I keep thinking it's Jasper because of the accent. Jasper, did he come and visit me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, a lot, every day. And she's like, you're a terrible liar. Come on, dude. And he's like, yeah, look, I think it was really hard for him. Like, he didn't know what to do. And that's the thing. Like, he had to find, um, Kaz had to find an excuse to come and talk to Inej once she was better. But that lack of caring and that absence when she was recovering, like, was really hard for her. And it's that thing again where it's like he's still very calculating and and realizes that if he showed affection, it would unravel everything and he has to stay strong and protect himself by not getting too close. Oh, yeah, what? I think I think it's clear that he is terrified of laying his guard down and opening up and being and showing himself as a human being for even a moment because then it means he's no longer who he is right now, what he's built himself to be. Yeah, and that is this enigma of dirty hands, and he loves hiding behind that fear and terror. I also think the reason he puts on that persona is so that the rest of his crew doesn't have to be that hardcore of a, of a person. Like, they don't have to, like, do that stuff because he's willing to do it for them to keep them metaphorically clean, if that makes sense. Even though they're all thieves and murderers, they're not that level of, of psychotic behavior, I guess you can describe it. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> Mm, I hear you. I'm hearing that the Wyland card was a spoilery card. Oh, I don't know enough about Wyland yet. And I want everyone to tell me because it's just not sticking much, but everyone loves him. So we'll see with that one. Uh, I also want to talk, uh, Nick's, Nick's wing 38. You had a really great conversation about his vulnerability as well. His weakness is that his leg is kind of holding him back a little bit. Did you want to have a conversation about that? Uh, um, I also, also, in general, like this book has way better representation than the other books. I know that's something that Leah Bardugo like was told and then fixed that in her writing. Mm. Um, and she included that with a character that has a disability. And I think that's really cool. And we saw that actually in the TV show where he's having to overcome bits of that, where he couldn't have his cane when they were pretending to be guards. Mm. And he, uh, there's a moment where he had pain in his leg. Um, I think a lot of people that have chronic pain could definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, and just like that he has also that lack of control uh, and he has this like specially made cane that allows him to be deadly. He was able to take down Matthias with just his cane. Um, and there's just so many ways where he's found ways to have power again, but he still has limits. He was very limited when he was trying to save Inej. Bardugo also walks with a cane. That is really fascinating. I didn't know that. So there you go. So she's really kind of like writing her life into it. And Kaz is such a formidable character as well to have that happen to. Last question. I've got his picture up on the screen. What do we think of the casting? Everyone open your mics and give me a yay or nay. Definitely yay. Very good. Yay. Yes, yay. <laughs> Definitely, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves the casting. What is it about the show? The two of you were mentioning that he was sort of like toned down a little bit. First of all, who are the two that said that? And can you uh, expand that a little bit more? Violet said that. I yeah, I said it too. I think it felt more like they were trying to make him a little more uh, sympathetic, or maybe almost like having in the show. Um, Pekka come into it uh, and sort of get the jump on him just felt really off. Hold on, I've got to remove an attachment. Terry posted what is definitely a spoiler and it hungy spoiled for me right now. I'm okay with spoilers, but I have so many thoughts because I'm like wondering what it is. And Grisha Pellas and that's exciting. This book is going to be so good. It made me more excited. It made me more excited about this book. That's so cool. Sorry, Kat, that was fantastic. Uh, um, Aaron, it sounds like you're completely on the same page with that. Yeah, curious, curious what she was saying, like, you know, hey, again, eyeballs we're just gonna keep circling around to that moment but also like like the, at the beginning with the the gang meetup and he like had a guard because he found out his you know blackmail you know info and was willing to shoot one of his guys because he betrayed him and then also by the way while we're doing this fire the guy at my table so he's not even involved <laughs> in this moment but because he's screwed up get rid of him too He's just got tabs on everyone and everything. And it was really interesting in that moment that Giles was using money as a form to bribe. But it's so interesting that Kaz realises that secrets 
are priceless. And with that, he doesn't have to have a bunch of money. All he has to do is just know things. And the the one up that he had on Gills was like, this is your girlfriend's address. This is what I know. And she's your weakness. And I will exploit that so that you can do my bidding. He even does it a little bit with Nina when Nina gets so angry at him and she's like, I can stop your heart right now. And he's like, yeah, but you need Matthias. And Matthias is in that prison and we're getting him out. So you need me. Everyone in this, um, in the Six of Crows, the reason why he's so good, they all need him. Jesper gets his betting fix because he's got a tab for him you know it's like eye on the supply so it's like super <laughs> you're all good terry you're all good um uh big bolliger was a uh, big bolliger was it bolliger or bolliger bolliger yeah he was mentioned in the show too jesper mentions him that's cool i dig that um all righty so that's kez Bre kaz brecker sorry we've done with kaz I have, I need it. I need like three more screens to be able to do this properly. Next is Inej. So I would love everyone to weigh in on Inej. She is the wraith. Her skill, she's a stealthy, sneaky assassin. I've played this D&D character before. It's so fun. Um, weakness, she's a little bit lost. Um, she, I'd love actually, I'd love a little bit of a help, help with this. What is her individual motivation and her weakness, would you say? Because her strength is incredible. She's such an asset. What's her weakness? Who wants to weigh in on that? I feel Inez's weakness is her faith. Now, hear me out on this. Because she's so uh, set in a bubble, you know, because the way that the faith is uh, regimenting her, it, it hinders her from doing certain things. You know, um, again, this is just my point of view. Um, I think her strength, though, is that her ability to take on any task, it doesn't matter what it is, she'll get it done. Okay. Her faith, I think, shows up a little bit more in the show than it does in the book. But people are agreeing with you on that one, Jimmy. Probably her faith. Who else wants to weigh in on this? Avery. Oh. Keeper of Ancient Wisdom, and then we'll move to Knox. Yeah, um, she still owes Kaz. His, uh, her indenture is a completely paid off. Um, Kaz bought it for um, his boss, um, Haskell, but they're not in a position yet to completely pay that off. So she still feels bound to him she still um she still owes him and maybe to a certain extent uh can't be completely free mm. so her weakness is the desire for free freedom but not being in the grasp of it and being indentured in a way i like that Knox, what were you gonna say that's what i was oh yeah it was a lot like that she's been owned before and she's been that um, Suli girl at the menagerie that was just a caricature and they had to do things she didn't want to, you know, be in herself to do. A reluctant killer in the show, big time. And Crudo Nation says it as well. The show gives her a lot of weakness, like she's afraid to kill and until she has to. And for an assassin, <laughs> you got to kill. Uh, Kate, did you want to weigh in? Oh, I just typed it in there, but. She's a character for you because Suli are essentially Romani. They're nomadic people. So there's like a natural freedom to how she was raised even. It's in her blood. And she like as to not be tied down to be free, but then she finds herself free from slavery. But she owes Kaz and her feelings for him are also like an anchor. So she's still not free. It's all about her trying mm. to get free. And that's what's super interesting as well about Inej. Like her people are, are nomadic and yet she, was it with her brother? Is that also in the book or is that just the show? Her brother the show. got it. So she has a brother in it and she's trying to find her brother again because they were both basically kidnapped, taken in, and um, sold into slavery. Um, so that that contradiction like that, you know, she's a, a, a free people from the free people and yet now just different types of lack of freedom, you know? Oh, I get that. I feel like the show was more like her assassin origin story almost. Kat, do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, uh, 
I don't know that I have much to uh, say more about that other than just, um, you know, I know talking with friends, we were talking about how in the show she seems really reluctant to ever kill um, and like she hasn't killed anybody before. And I think maybe what we saw in the show was her her first kill. Mm. Um, and so I don't know if it got easier for her later or mm. what. What do you think of an edge? I, uh, I think she's a great character. I really like her. I like her. Um, I, she's just so reserved a little bit, um, which isn't necessarily the thing I like about her. It's just, she seems like a very unique character, uh, to me. Yeah. Yeah. The Suli remind me of the uh, Edema Ra. Oh, I love that comparison. And I see it completely. They're more fighters, though, but I get that. They're basically like, let's be real, they're the monk class in D&D &D <laughs> with key points. Um, all righty. So, oh, I've sorry, guys. I've got 19 things open. Um, what do you think about, and this is more for my, my ladies or anyone there who identifies as being a woman, what do you think about the trope that women work in the whole house and that's kind of all they can do, unless you're in the Thieves Guild? Thank you for that throne of glass. But what do you feel about that? Because Nina is as well, but in a different way. She's offering her services. It's a world of slavery, though, so I feel like it makes sense because I mean, even in our world, real world right now, there are problems with human trafficking. Yeah. Where where are those people going? They're obviously going into sexual slavery. Yeah. So, I mean, in that kind of situation, it 100% makes sense. It sucks, but it makes sense. Mm. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I just feel like, you know, if it's set in that, that time and you're that low on the rung, then that's just like, that's just what it is. Which is kind of like, ugh, man, the world sucks. Creditation 3000 says, and for a sneaky assassin, how is she tied to the birdcage lady? Like, she can't leave town without a permission. Why couldn't she disappear with her skill other than fear um, holding her back? We actually kind of come, come across this in the book where the madame finds her out roaming about, being like, I can always find you. I always know where you are. I always see my little links. Or well, was that what this was called? Links? Links? Yep. Okay. Uh, last thoughts with the Nej. Do we like the casting? Everyone, shout out. Yep. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, I still see her as, as I was reading the book. And not all the characters look like their actor compatriots, but I kept imagining Inez as the actress who plays her. She's, she's really good. Same. On. Yeah. As soon as I saw that, I was like, boom, locked in. All righty. We are moving on to the next Jesper. This is an easy one. His skills. He's a sharpshooter, loves his guns, pew, pew, can duel. Again, this is like a fighting class in D&D. &D. Uh, weakness, boy loves a gamble. Just cannot walk away from a bet. His individual motivation, I would like to discuss this a little further, only because out of all the backstories we've heard about, I feel like I know about him the least. What does everyone think about Jesper? What's your take on this guy? He's so charismatic in the show. We find out, I mean, we're only talking about the first three chapters and first three parts of this book, but um, we find out that he's gay or at least bisexual, uh, queer disaster, as Kate calls him. What is his backstory? What's his motivation? Who wants to weigh in? I will. I feel like him and Inej are opposites of each other. They're like the same coin where she is very like a character of freedoms and being, but she's very reserved and like a shadow and, you know, like the way she flits in and out and is able to just move silently and quietly. He does everything bombastically and with flash and loud, like, I mean, even his weapons are loud and flashy <laughs> and he's a character of just vices. So he, yeah, he's like an adrenaline junkie, but he's like an, he's obviously got a gambling addiction, but just everything is very like, now and immediate and 
colorful and bombastic. So him and Inej are, they kind of balance each other out very well Mm. with Kaz in the center of their opposites. Yeah, I agree with the dynamic in the trilogy. You have someone who's very strategic and planned out and in the know, and the other one's just chaotic, you know, spontaneous. And I and I understand that. I really like what Aaron said there. He's an adrenaline junkie. And there's a fantastic line in the uh, in the book where it basically said he feels most alive when he's in a fight. Like <laughs> when when he can draw his guns and when it's a life or death situation, that's when he's in the most control. And that's when he's the most alive, like the fact that he's like, you know, flirting with death. I think that's such an interesting take. Uh, Aaron, you've got great thoughts and insights into this. Do you want to tell me what you've been writing? Sure. Uh, my last one was basically he he just likes to fight, drink, gamble, like just anything that just can get him on the edge without obviously meeting death fully. Uh, and he seems the type that like boredom would probably be the death of him. Yeah. Like confinement, not being able to do anything, especially not even being able to hold his guns because they seem like a safety blanket to him, both in the show and in the book. Mm. And he was just more probably miserable on that boat than everybody else, and everybody was pretty miserable. But then it was interesting because when he got there, he was like, oh, man, I can't believe I missed the boat. <laughs> right, because it's like, well, it's cold here, and I'm from Minnesota, and I know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. And- Oh, got it. Yeah, I would not like to be in the cold. That's just me. Um, they showed that a little in the show that he gets excited about a heist. Yeah, this is what he, this is his purpose. But what is his ongoing motivation? Why did he join the dregs? What's his what's his motivation? Anyone? Uh, I feel Jasper's motivation, and I could be wrong about this is that um, hopefully this isn't too big of a spoiler, but I, I'm sure if you read the book, you know about it. Uh, Jesper's mom was a Grisha. So he is a Grisha and he hides it so well that he probably wants to live up to his standard and, and show his mom that he could do it without the Grisha powers in a way. You know what I mean? Kind of like he's a flashy guy, but... He's trying to act normal about it. You know what I mean? Uh, Grisha's yeah. very open about it. Did we know that? Oh. Did we all know that about his mom? Nope. Okay, no. Well, uh, it's in the book. I'm not lying. <laughs> Is it? You clearly look in the book and see it. We're talking about parts one, two, and th- oh, no. Did you read the whole book, my man? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> We're talking about parts one, two, and three, just the first half of the book. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was really excited to read the book, but <laughs> I mean, that's a good thing. I This is what I have to do now. I get to the part and then I start again. So I read everything or listen to everything twice because before I would just want to keep reading. So I totally understand that. That's okay. That makes sense. <laughs> I wanted to say beforehand. I threw it out. Uh huh. All right. Well, does anyone else want to weigh in about Jesper's motivation backstory? Because we haven't tapped into it too much in the first half of the book. Anyone else? Knox. Knox. Uh, Jesper's got a lot riding on his, his his gambling habits, and his he seems he's motivated by money, but I think even more so is the sort of not quite family, but the. Uh, he really looks up to Kaz, you can tell, and he wants Kaz to be impressed with him or at least mm. appreciate him. Yeah. I like that. And I also like that you said your name before you started speaking as well because there's no way to kind of show it on the stream, so that was really helpful. Oh, thank you. Does anyone else want to talk about the infamous Jesper? Okay. Sweet. We kind of have a little bit more about his motivation now. Um, Where is my, come on, where's my rundown gone? There it is. We've done Jesper. Uh, Next we're going to move on to Nina. Uh, Nina, what do we think about Nina? Her skill? You love Nina? I love how sassy she is and just like so sure of herself and just very, very extroverted, very charming. Very just like, don't make your problem my problem. I love that attitude. Uh, it's easy to say like her strength, she's she's a heart render. Like what an amazing skill set. 
Uh, she was raised in the little palace, so she's learned about how to be a corporal guy. Um, she, yeah, she specializes in basically messing with that heart, slowing it down, manipulating emotions, speeding up the heart to raise uh, body temperature. Um, but she also got caught by the Drus, what is it? Drus, Druska. The witch hunters. Druskela. Druskela, yes. Um, and the Fjerden Druskela, where they basically go around trying to find Grisha and then charge them basically just to kill them because they think that they're an abomination. Um, so the, Nina's strength is that she's a heart render uh, and that she can talk her way into and out of situations. Um, her weakness is that she got caught um, but I also think her weakness, I don't want to say this because I don't see it as a weakness at all, but these emotions are just messing with her inside and out. Um, she, for a heart render that like, you know, calms people and makes, uh, you know, helps people with their grief, she feels a lot. Uh, I would love to hear, um, from anyone who wants to chat about Nina, what do you think of the character? Love Nina so much. Um, and I love getting to know her more through the book. The TV show definitely made me interested in her, but in the book I'm really getting to see more of how she thinks. I also love actually seeing what a proper Grisha training is supposed to be like mm. and learning about the differences between healers and heart renders, which... I don't know if there actually is a difference. It seems like it's just their training and how they're taught to approach it almost. Mm. I don't know if they actually have established that there is like an actual difference in the power. I That was the first time I'd really heard about like the subgenre of being the corporate archive. Um, the fact that, you know, in your first few years or whatever, you learned about healing, you learn about heart rendering, you learn about fabrication, you learn about like all those sorts of things. And then you fall into your talent and then you're like, cool, this is where you excel. This is what you should be. Um, so she knows how to do a little bit of all of it. So she's like, can heal, but no, she's not great at it. She can do other things, but you know, she can kind of tailor, but she's not great at it. So she's got like a basic skill set, but then she you know, moved into like an ex expert level in heart rendering. So I agree. I really liked that we learned more about that. I wish we had that in the Shadow and Bone series when we were at the college, the little palace. Ugh. So I like that a lot. Um, there is amazing comments. Uh, Aaron, I'd love you to expand on what you just wrote because that's such a great analogy. Uh, I was saying that for her weakness for Nina, I feel like she's just really over eager, like not only to please but also just to do anything like she's just like ready to like you know explore what she can do and how she can be useful and my analogy was she would probably run to the edge of a cliff before she realizes she's at that edge and that's what like feelers over thinkers can do i was very much a very reactive and emotional person so i understand that completely yeah she's like the polar opposite of kaz where he's like very cold and calculating, he will like do things, but only when he knows he's, you know, got all the facts to do it. Like he'll gamble if he if he feels he has to, but he would prefer to go with all the facts. And she's just like, I'm all in. I don't care if it's gonna work or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's ruled by her feelings, I think for sure. Uh, Kate, you had a really good analogy as well. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Oh yeah, that she uses she has a like. She's so kind of empathetic and caring that she uses this kind of like brash, you know, Jessica Rabbit almost persona as armor. So it's like keeping, you know, the real softer feelings behind this kind of, you know, bombastic, the same, like the same sort of thing with Jessica where she's like larger than life. Yeah. But it's hiding this like deep caring about people. And it must really kind of like, when you really look at her feelings towards Matthias, yeah that it's like she she's essentially in love with like a nazi ss officer in a way like who just wants to like exterminate her but she sees like these flashes in him of like a real person but then is like oh no this person that i actually care about just wants to murder everyone who's like me so it's just 
there's a lot going on there. And I can't wait to talk about it. But she's a little bit like me where it's like, here is a guy. He continually shows me who he is. But I've seen a glimpse of that goodness. So I'm going to hold on to that and I'm going to ignore all the crap because the good thing is what I'm focusing on. And that's where I'm going to put all my focus and efforts. Girl. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Avery, you had a really great analogy as well. Do you want to explore that? Uh, yeah, so um, I just talked about how uh, she's really powerful and we see that, but we also can see her age. Like uh, Kaz mentions it, that he's like, I see a 17-year-old girl in front of me. She's scared. And um, everyone else has been out on the streets forever. And she has only been there for, what, like a year? Yep. So she's still really bothered by a lot of the things that she sees. And although she has the power to just stop someone's heart, she doesn't necessarily enjoy that kind of violence. Um, and she seems to be a lot more sensitive than the rest of them. Great observation. I mean, when we uh, when we learnt about um, from Alina and Mal when they were getting tested, the big sell was if you become a Grisha, you'll go to the little palace and you'll be spoiled. You will have fine clothes. You will eat delicious foods. You will be waited on. You will be treated like near royalty. Even though she's a great, great observation is there uh, inside as well there, the keeper of ancient wisdom saying she's been trained as a soldier though. She has, but she's done it with the confines of like, you know, not living in a tent really. Um, she had a lot of luxury in that path. Um, and you're exactly right. Ketadam is just, what is it? Like it was compared to like a leaky sink or something where basically everything just leaks and is awful. Like this place is just, you can smell it. It's just grimy and like, oh, like slick in the wrong ways and just gross and sewerage and, you know, that kind of vibe. So you're exactly right. She's just like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in Ketadam. Like, God, Ketadam, I don't want to be here. Um, but she had to because this little thing keeps the fact that she's a heart render, but she, she, that heart absolutely does the feels for it all. Um, oh, my gosh, that's such an astute observation too, Thierry. The actress playing Nina reminds me of Kate Winslet, not just because of the sea wreck, two fit on the door moment. <laughs> two fit on the door. Hello. <laughs> that's very funny. Um, but you, yeah, you're exactly right with that, uh, you know, with her not, not wanting to start from the bottom, not wanting to get her hands dirty. Um, she's able to use her skill set in a way that feels safe for her. Uh, she understands that she is an asset and that she's, you know, able to kind of like get, sell her skill set a lot of the time, but you're exactly right. She's a little bit like a, Oh, Oh, I'm trying my best. Oh my gosh. I'm not used to this, you know? Um, and the fact that she was kind of living in Zoya's shadow while she was at the, the little palace as well, which I loved that there were mentions from that and I wrote them down and we'll go over them in the end as well. She went to a high-end military academy versus enlisting. Exactly. Uh, and Kate says her and Wyland are similar in that regard. They both came from privilege, unlike Kaz, Inej or Jesper, and I think that that's why that trio is like very... Um, before we move uh, on from Nina, anyone want to drop one last wisdom nugget about Nina? Is anyone, is she your favorite? Because if not, we're going to move to this boy, Matthias. My goodness. His strength is his strength. <laughs> his weakness is that he is like arguing with a someone who's so set in their ways and there is no flexibility. Thank you, Kate. His weakness is his zealot tree. This guy is just like, we call it lawful evil. They live and die by the rules and the book, but what they do is not necessarily good. They, in, they are enforcers and it's like you don't really stop to think about what it is that you're doing because they truly believe that it is the greater good and that is his weakness. Uh, but dude killed three wolves. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, he's strong. Um, but his values and he's just uh, so boring. So we have Matthias and Nina being polar opposites. She's flamboyant, flirtatious, suggestive. She loves making him uncomfortable. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I totally understand that one. Um, and he is so rigid. He's just this stoicism that has no place. It's a really interesting dynamic. So I would love to talk about these two 
getting their cold on. Uh, first of all, we are introduced to this uh, duo separately-ish in the books. In the shows, we see the backstory play out. Do you like the fact that the book started sort of like at the present moment and then explored the backstory together? Because I watched the show first, it was like it seemed quite natural for me, but I'm wondering if anyone who read the book first, that was a little disjointed. Knox. Go, Knox. I think it's interesting. You know, we talked about how the, the point of view in the books was so different from Shadow and Bone to these books but actually it's still first person it's just each chapter is a different person but we get so much more of the inner dialogue and the, the struggle which they try to portray in the show but having that backstory play out in the show was was interesting so we actually begin with that instead of beginning with the the struggle that's going on with matthias having been in prison for a year yeah. Has anyone read the Night Angel trilogy? I get very second book vibes from this moment. That's all I'll say. Anyone? Anyone? Cool. Just Yeah, Chris, you know what I'm talking about? I read it too. Oh, yeah? Do you know what I'm talking about then? Yay. It's been a while. You may have to like give a little tiny more hint about it. Really strong guy, gets sent to prison and has to kind of fight his way out. Oh, oh. Yeah, no, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, tall, blonde. Uh, one of the secondary characters, but yeah. That's it. Uh, Michelle, I want to talk about the his inner monologue reeks of incel doctrine to me. Please, let's explore that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, <laughs> I've been a lurker on the internet long enough to see the signs and, you know, they live among us. <laughs> like... I, I get the appeal with him and Nina, and they're very Romeo and Juliet. You can see it. Like, it's just, a, you know, just two sides of an unending war. But, like, the just, like, you're a tease or all the stuff is, like, he, she's tricking me. It's, like, like, all the stuff about, like, these crazy theories about women <laughs> and, like, their place in the world. Yeah. I don't know. It was just like I Fjord and women do not do that. They don't fight. That. They stay at home. They're not combative. They don't have a personality. They do what they're we, told. We okay. Generate our women. It's like, okay, buddy. Sure. And again, but women are seen as temptations time. for them. Yeah. I mean, it's also like the dehumanizing of the Grisha, and especially yeah. you see with Nina, um, you know, just reducing another human being to something else, something less than dogs, human or yeah. evil. Yeah. Um, that we just, you know, you could, you can see that creeping through with him makes him very complicated. I really want to expand on one sort of like analogy that you had, cause I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And that's the fact that these two are like a Romeo and Juliet. And I thought it's, initially feels like that because it's a forbidden love but in the case of Romeo and Juliet it was external forces stopping their love from happening but they wanted to do anything to pursue and to like to continue their relationship so they were willing to shun everything and every like everyone that they knew and everything that they were to have this love what we're having here is actually more akin to a Democrat, an extreme leftist and an extreme right trying to like being super attracted to each other, really wanting this relationship, but their core values just cannot align and they refuse to compromise. They can like at the end of the day, Nina is always going to be a Grisha, you know, and that's the thing that um, Matthias is sworn to sort of destroy. And so they just cannot get past this fundamental identity of who they are um and that's what's really compelling for me where it's like he has these moments where he's like oh my gosh I love watching her eat because she just like the way he describes her and notices like nuance with her she just savors everything that she does like oh I noticed that she smells different she stopped smelling like roses and now she smells like toffee um the fact that there is this surging tension between them 
and that they really do sort of like love each other. That's a great one, Aaron. The Jon Snow and you greet is a lot more like it where it's like you are this person. I am from this clan. We are sworn enemies. And even though you look real cool naked in a hot spring, uh, eventually I'm going to have to kill you. And that's just who I am. That's what my clan's about. And that's who you are. And it is what it is. But they love each other. I think it's still even more than that because I mean, they can still walk away from who they are. Nina can never walk away from being a Grisha. She's always going to be that. And I think Matthias has a little bit more. Nurture. Go on. Yeah. The, well, the, their, it's like their nurture parts of themselves have just taken over. And, you know, the, the, the moments of their nature, which is like they're attracted to each other and then seeing each other as humans, like that's just so such a small part of them and their indoctrination on both sides has absolutely taken over their psyche. That is a fantastic way to describe it. Their nature is this force that they cannot be reckoned with. Like it is this impulse. It is unwavering, unshakable. They are trying to suppress it completely, but they are just so... That, that exactly that desire is so strong but uh Aaron jump on in because that's really fantastic what you just wrote there uh yeah I was saying that basically because of like you were kind of describing them before like you know they're like complete polar opposites on like you know where they stand in their life that the, like their sense of duty their identity for who they are and what they want like are in complete conflict with each other and it doesn't go away. It's not an easy fix. It doesn't seem like there's ever going to be like a real solution. But what's really uh, incredible with these two is that even though they're at odds and they're at war and they're like in this together and each serves um, a purpose in the group, they actually bond over the fact that both of their beliefs truly understand that Bo, oh man, what a name. I'll get it. I have it up here somewhere. Bo, Bo, Logo, Bo, Bo, Bo. Where is he? Boyle Bayer, Bo Boyle Bo, Bayer, who is basically the Grisha who has yeah. designed the um, Judaparam. That, that he needs to die. Oh, the MacGuffin, absolutely, that he has to die. So they are kind of like on the same page with that, and that's almost bonding them a little bit. Uh, but you've also got the part where it's like she's leaving out massive bits of information. So he's establishing this whole thing basically in a lie and she waited too long and that, that kind of infuriates me with writing where it's like I just I mean I would have told him but would it even have mattered well yeah, yeah if you tell him then you'll know <laughs> like use your words people communication is so important in these particular situations so that bothered me a little bit um but what is uh, let's weigh in anyone who hasn't spoken about the Matthias and Nina coupling what do you think? Is this your favorite part of the book? Why do you like it? Why do you not like it? Do you find it tropey? Do you find it refreshing? Talk to me. Anyone at all? Go Knox. Go Knox. Um, there's so much going on with all the different characters that I almost, you know, thought about the oh. title of the book as Six of Crows. We've got six leading characters and they're all involved with one another in different ways. And the, Nina and Matthias are sort of the, I don't know what the word is, the, the, um, the power couple, if you will. Yeah. And their, their love is so tumultuous. It's, it's, you know, you talk about how you want to hear more about the, the backstory and, and I've read through both books now and, and no spoilers, but you get a lot of the answers you're looking for as cool. the books go on. So Okay. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for um, the correction that Bo Bolagola is not – I've got to get that down. It, they say it so effortlessly in the, the audio book. Boyulbeya, Boyulbeya, Boyulbeya. Like, how easy is that? Boyulbeya, Boyulbeya. It's fun. Um, but he's not a Grisha. He's a uh, Shuhan scientist. And then Nix was like, yeah, I also assumed that he was like a material guy. So there you go. Because like he's messy. He's basically like an alchemist. He's just messing around with the stuff. He's, he's breaking bad, you know. <laughs> uh, Miss Necromancer, do you want to jump in with your thoughts that you wrote? 
I mean, it's a type of character is just never my favorite type of character. The like lawful evil religious like witch hunter kind of murder for the faith kind of character. Yeah. I just never like those characters. So it's not my favorite part of the book, but it's well written. Yeah. It's really like it's a good take on that kind of like Romeo and Juliet trope because of the reasons that you just mentioned where it's like in their cores it's not forces keeping them apart. It's themselves at their cores. They're you know, Nina can never not be a Grisha. I mean Matthias can stop being a dickhead, but she can never stop being a Grisha. Yeah. So it's just but that's all he knows. Like that's how he's been brought up. He doesn't this is really his first time being among people who weren't Gardens yeah. for his whole life because he was, you know, training to be True Skell and then he ended up getting in the shipwreck. So he was only with Nina, but then he got thrown in jail. So the one person who might open his eyes about, you know, hey, like maybe I'm wrong about wanting to murder people because, you know, some power in their blood kind of thing that she betrayed him. Yeah. So of course, any good feelings about that were going to go away and he was stuck in prison for a year. So this is the first time in his life he's with people who are not indoctrinating him on the true scale, you know, lifestyle. And what's, it's just very, it's very interesting. Yeah. And I was gonna say, what's so interesting about that is that he, like Kaz has had a lot of um, loss, grief, uh, the Inferni, the Grisha army, kind of came in and, and killed his parents and his younger sister. So he is fueled by vengeance. So what does he do? He joins sort of like a, a group where they are taught to dehumanize Grisha um, and have power over others um, and basically kill them, but deny them any sort of like basic human right. And then he goes to jail and he kills animals to have like a slight more privilege. Oh my God, he's so a uh, paladin. Yes, he really is. Um, which I've never played a paladin and that's probably why. But with that, every single turn, he is getting, re like anger is reinforced. So vengeance is fueled by anger. Um, this oppression and like, you know, being a law enforcement that literally like dehumanizes people that there's an anger with that being in jail resentment anger violence so it's um yeah just like this guy is just tunnel visioned hate he is absolutely the person that wrote a memoir well this is all the reasons in society let me down and that's why i'm gonna do what he does um Keeper of Ancient Wisdom, this new environment is contrary to the sense of honour that was instilled uh, in him by the Driscoll. It was a sense of honour even if it was misguided. Yeah, this is this whole pal um, Paladin thing where it's like Paladin, Paladin, Paladin. Oh, I forget what the Vasa says. Paladin, Paladin. Not Paladin Aladdin? Is that what I use to say it's not like that or it is like that? Someone will help me phonetically. That would be great. Or you just say it. Like, we're on a chat. That's cool. I'm getting, guys, I'm second. Um, to thank you. <laughs> Paladin. Paladin? <laughs> Not like Aladdin. <laughs> Paladin. <laughs> oh, guys, that was a slippery slope for me, and I was like, whoo, going downhill real fast with that. He is Drax. Nah. Oh. Drax has empathy. Yeah, fair enough, Kate. Fair enough. I'm kind of in that same boat, so I feel you. Yeah, Aaron? To clarify, he is Drax in the fact that he has tunnel vision because of what happened to him and his family. Yes. That's okay, like, got it. You killed someone that I love, therefore. And that's, you know, the Inigo, I mean, Inigo Mentoya. I mean, look at the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. He called Ronan so he could attack him because he's like, I don't care what happens to everybody else. I just want my vengeance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you killed my father, prepared to die. I spent my whole life trying to kill this man, and now that I've done it, who am I? I have no identity. Yeah, I get that. And I think that's what we have. Matthias is starting to learn that the more and more he betrays the Fjordans, the less actual identity he has. And I think that's messing with him a little bit. We've still got more characters to go through. 
I do like talking about those two, though. Um, we've got uh, Wylan. Wylan's next, but I don't know how much we want to talk about it. We're only talking about the first half of the book. I just saw a little bit of a spoily spoily. So do we want to talk about Wylan, why you like him, what's his strength, the precious little cinnamon roll? Go on, Kate. This innocent 16-year-old boy who looks so, so, so young, but he's like, I'm not that much younger than you guys. And they're like, shut up, dude. He's very, like, well, he's a rich kid, right? So he's very not like any of these people at all. He grew up very, you know, never having to worry about food, never having to worry about shelter, never having to worry about, you know, getting the shit kicked out of him walking down the street. And they even mention it that it's like, you've been away from your house for how long in the worst neighborhood in town? And you've never been pickpocketed or beaten up or anything. It's just so he has just no idea about the world around him and even the world he's living in because Kaz has been shielding him the entire time because he's the same way that he said with Inez. She's just a valuable asset because of who he is. So he's just this oblivious, idealistic, even more idealistic than Nina. And he doesn't know anything about how the world really is, but he wants to. I think there's this really... It's just kind of a... Oh, oh. no, sorry. Oh, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent, so feel free to finish the thought. <laughs> yeah, okay. My ten... Oh, just that he, just, he loves education, too. Like, he was, like, learning about, you know, machinery, and he started going on, like, you know, like, a nerd tangent even about talking about learning about like bombs and learning about like other things or he's like don't you want to learn about stuff that's not where you had that conversation with, with jesper Jeff. i loved that moment and jess was like no i know what i know i don't need to know anything more and i'm here going oh my god fixed mindset growth mindset and that's why i was like all right well and like you're a little lot cooler because he just wants to learn and that hunger and thirst of knowledge is something that I can relate to completely. Um, we also talk about honor and I feel like we could do some sort of like really cool, um, what's the circle chart where there's overlapping and there's strings going. But the thing that uh, Matthias and Waylon will, will have in common is honor, uh, integrity, because um, the moment when Kaz absolutely loses it and he's like, please, if you, if I tell you, will you get me help? Will you send for a doctor? Like, you know, the guy who, got um in edge and he was like you have my word basically like yeah if you tell me the information i'll i'll look after you and then he doesn't he throws him over the the side into the water um and venn diagram thank you so much kate uh and it's this thing where he like yells out to kaz and like defies the leader's orders going no you said that you would help him what are you doing you're going back on it and he's like dude you have no idea you don't get how this works this is the ugly side of what we do and Waylon's like kind of like clutching his pearls being like, but you said. And I think that that was interesting for him because he's realizing like this is a different game. This is not, there is no trust and honor. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was like a really hard pill for him to swallow. So it is, I'm not lost though. He's very much flying under the radar in the first half of the book, right? We don't get a chapter from his perspective, do we? He's just a character that flits in and out a little bit. Anyone want to jump in? Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Anyone going to jump in about Wylan? Is he? Does he have his own chapter? Is he flying under the radar in the first half of the book? Yeah. All right. Hit me, Knox. Yeah, there's there's a lot, you know. Like I said, all the characters get you, you end up with the backstories and depth of, of all the characters before you're done with the two books. Got it. Lisa's going. Uh, you know what? I've got a lot to say about it, but we're going to wait until next week because don't want to spoil. All right. So I'm not sort of like in my own head about the fact that he's very much like a ghost of a character. We don't know an awful lot about him in the first half of the book. Just that he's kind of there. Okay. Alrighty, what's his strength? Explosions, demolition. His weakness, he's a naive little boy, <laughs> a very protected young thing. He seems like expensive baggage at this point. Yeah, what did it mean by that, Nick? Being a hostage is his strength. Can you go into that a bit more? Yeah, well, because he's the son of the merchant that hired them for this job. 
And so Kaz is like, of course, thinking three steps ahead. And he's like, okay, if the guy doesn't pay us, we have his son with us. So we'll just threaten his son if he doesn't pay us for this job. I didn't know it was the one who made the offer. Got it. I just thought he was a rich merchant's son. Missed that in my double listen. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he's the same merchant's son and just an elaborate hostage for the entire thing. Got it, got it. Like, I think someone even asked uh, Kaz, why not just, like, leave him with someone in Ketterdam? And he's like, no, I don't trust it. He's coming with us. Well, I actually have a thought about that because Matthias is not a 100% sure thing. Like, for a few chapters into it, he's still like, I, don't, I won't do it or I'll betray them or I won't give them the information. And every single time I give them the information, I feel more and more sick. And uh, uh, uh. and I think that the fact that Wyland knew about and had gone into the ice court, the ice palace before um, and has seen sort of like the internal structure of it and can help it was A, a way to make sure that um, Matthias wasn't going to betray them or give misinformation. And so he was like, yeah, he's been in there. So he's going to know if you're bullshitting us. And that if Matthias obviously didn't do it, that they still had some like some information. Um, and this is a thing where it's like any kind of scenario, Kaz has backup plan on backup plan. So I sort of noticed that that was a reason why he was there as well, because he had the ice intel. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in with that? We're putting well into rest. Oh, man, this is going to be an interesting second half of the book. I tell you what. Just a random thought that I have when you said that about like Kaz, he would do very well in Dune with a plan within plan within plans. Dude, he he's kind of like one of the oh, I've forgotten it because it's been so long. What are they? Benny Gesserit. Benny Gesserit. He is like that, isn't he? A little bit. <laughs> Ish. Ish. Um Something that I want to talk about as well, the three references. And if anyone else caught another one, (laughs) let's go. But the references about Shadow and Bone that were mentioned in Six of Crows so far, the first half of the book. First of all, we had Santa Alina. Inej had a dagger named after Santa Alina. I thought that that was quite interesting because technically, where does series one end in the book series season one what do you mean by that coordination where does the series season one end in the book so we're talking shadow and bone so it's technically two years before the events of this book take place so that's why i kind of like that sanctor alina was a knife because we know that technically she died as a martyr and that this was like to honor a saint that a living saint that did exist but is no longer in the world i was like oh the next, there is a King Nikolai reference. I forget when and how, but I heard it and I was like, hey, hey, hey King Nikolai, hell yeah. He's doing his thing. Um, and then Nina bringing up Zoya or the fact that Matthias had heard of Zoya because she has such a strong reputation in the Grisha um, and that Nina almost is kind of like in her shadow a little bit. Zoya would be like, you would be too hard for us. You would, you know. You're basically way us down. And then the fact that Matthias is like, yeah, I heard of, I've heard of Zoya. We all know about Zoya. Her reputation precedes her. I was like, man, Zoya is such a strong character in this. Jenya was mentioned with the eye droplet kind of things to change the eye color. Yes. Um, Nina's backstory, she mentions King Nikolai needing more Grisha. There you go. Alina Knife. Yes, yes, yes. The Zoya mentions. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but in the show, Jasper actually has a copy of Shadow and Bone. Yeah, thrown at him David. by David. Yes. yes. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Boop, boop. <laughs> Who throws a book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just immediately thought of Austin Powers, though. Seriously, who throws a shoe? <laughs> anyway. Uh, she said that Genya was better than her. Yeah, Genya, yeah. The fact that Genya, as a material guy, wasn't she a fabricator, made the the tincture to change the eye color, I thought was really great. In general, the phrasing of the whole conflict of Shadow and Bone being called the Ravkin Civil War is interesting. That really threw me off. I thought the Civil War was like, because I'm so used to it being like an earlier war that just took place, like, you know, that kind of was like forged of history, not so recently. Um, yeah. 
Oh, and in the show when Alina gives Inej the knife, I know just what to name it. Oh, I missed that one. I need to go back and watch the series again now that I'm reading Six of Crows, and I might do it once I finish. Or do you go in the scene where she's, uh, Alina is displaying her power? Only because I saw the behind the scenes photos, but I didn't notice it in the show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a quick thing because she's standing right next to, uh, what's her name? The, uh, the wind summoner lady. Zoya. She's standing right next to her. Yeah, yeah. I'm terrible oh. with names. I apologize. That's all right. But, uh, yeah. She was standing right next to her and, you know, she like briefly shakes her hand and just moves on. So it's, I just thought that was interesting to mention. Yeah. No, that's definitely worth mentioning. I like that. Um, there is one more thing, though. Uh, Nix, do you want to talk a little bit more about the whole fact that the Shadow and Bone section is now called the Civil War, the Rovkin Civil War? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, it's definitely, it definitely was that. I mean, the Darkling was Rovkin, and he was basically trying to assert the throne from within, and he had all these powers within like the apparat helping him at first. Bloody and apparat. It's very interesting to think about how all these foreign powers saw the conflict happening. Um, and it'd be curious to like think about which Grisha that are in Ketterdam now maybe sided with the Darkling at one point uh, or how different countries wanted that civil war to go. Yeah, I think I like the fact that Alina is Shu, but like when talking about like it actually affects all of these books now, that one change has like made massive ripple effect um, because like this whole subplot with the Shu sort of like wanting to get the um, Jada Perem, Jada, Jada Perem, Jada, Jada, it's never, it's never easy for me to just kind of like retain the words and do it the MacGuffin, the powder, the MacGuffin powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jerda Parem, Jerda Parem, Jerda Parem, Jerda Parem, Parem. You know what? Yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. Names are difficult. So, the three mentions is something that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I also I have another list of some of the questions. Uh, the genre flip we did go over. Um, yeah, we talked about the different viewpoints. Uh, the last one that I had is talk about the various loyalties and friendships that exist among and between the crew members. Because, yes, we know and have established that Inej and Kaz have feelings for each other but won't act on it ever. Uh, we kind of associated the fact that Wylan and Mateus have, like, sort of, like, similar integrity, like, of honour. Um, Inej, Jesper and Kaz all know what it's like to be sort of, like, street urchins. Um, Nina and Wyland know what it's like to have privilege and money. What are some of these other sort of loyalties and friendships? Like and Nina and Inej have become really, really close as well. Does anyone want to talk about a particular pairing or like uh, relationships within the six? It, I, I could be wrong about this, but I feel that uh, Inej and uh, Kaz are kind of like a surrogate family, parents to Wylan, you know, because he's so, uh, you know, uh, green, for yeah. lack of a better term, it, it helps him, you know, to better himself as opposed to the father who is more like, oh, you know, you do this, you do that. He's not really helping him out, his, his actual father. That's just my opinion. Okay. So there's like the, the dynamic of like sort of, not even being older brother, like older brother, older sister, younger sibling, that kind of thing? Yeah, I would say that, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what, however you want to say it. But I would agree with that statement, yes. Does anyone else want to weigh in on a particular pairing that we haven't yet discussed? Or a moment or a quote? I would love to open it up to quotes as well, if anyone has a good quote that they loved. Nix? Uh, I really liked Nina and Inej's friendship. Uh, Inej is who brought Nina into uh, the dregs, mm -hmm. and she was the one that went and saved her, basically, from starting working for Pekka Rollins. Uh, and they clearly have this, like, close friendship together, and I feel like that likely stems from both being women in this very hostile environment and trying to survive. 
Yeah. And there is a sense of nurturing. Like Nina was the one that was healing Inej and was with her every single day and they were getting to know each other and Nina sang to her and it was terrible. And, yeah, I, I get that completely. There's something that you can, you know, that only women are going to understand. You can kind of connect on a very, very different level. Yeah, I like that. Nox, I saw you unmuted. Did you have one? It was very similar, actually, the, the strength of sisterhood that's going on there. And, and then also we've got Wylan and Jesper so you're sort of noticing one another. Okay. Talk me. Jesper, sort of, Jesper seems, I mean, I always considered Wylan sort of like the younger brother in this family if there was a family to be had. And uh, going along with the naivete that he brings to the, to the table at this part of the book. I know it was a spoiler, but like, is Jesper's mum a squalor? Like, is that why? Is he guarding the bullets with his with, with the wind? Is that what it is? Does he actually have the powers? I have so many questions now that it's been spoiled for me. Oh, uh, it's irrelevant. Okay, okay, what okay. Kind of she was. Okay. I'm going to think about it a lot, though. I will keep reading. Well, you bet your butt I'm going to keep reading. Oh, because uh, your homework, obviously, is to finish the book. I have a red hair that's bothering me, and I can't got it. <laughs> uh, finish the book. We're going to be covering chapters four, five, and six. This is obviously going to be about the heist. Uh, a big observation that I have, because uh, I'm not sure if anyone else is in my boat and we've only read half of the book or if we uh, learn a little bit more about this, but um, usually the heist trope is that if you know about the plan, it doesn't go according to. So you either understand that there is a plan and then you see the aftermath and then it goes back and takes you step by step to how it is. But a lot of the time um, when you hear the game plan, this is what we do first, then that, then this, then that, then that. Yes, we, and we, they even went kind of through like the backup plans as well to we're all doomed. Um, usually when you have all of that information, that's not how it goes down. And there's, you know, not comedy ensues, but it's like catastrophe ensues because you know exactly how it's supposed to go and then you find out when and how it doesn't go according to plan. So that's my prediction of the the, the second half of the book. Also, these things that I did not see coming that are going to be in the second half of the book, which is going to be super juicy. Um, has anyone not read the second half of the book? Say aye. Aye. I have read the second book. No, the second half of the first book. All right, oh, Nix. Yeah, Nix, it's you and I. We've only read the first half of the first book. What do you think is going to happen in the second half of this book? Uh, I think we're going to see Matthias have to make a tough decision, definitely, between whether or not he's going to betray them. Yeah. Because um, he's been struggling and, with this from the whole, like, the whole time. Uh, and there's probably prisoners in that ice prison that Nina knows, that Nina trained with. <gasps> and I'm curious about anything like that happening. She needs to save other Grisha and then Matthias is probably like, I put them there. I can't take them out. <laughs> oh, wow. And I like that. Like, Nina having that of either sticking to the plan or saving other people. Matthias betraying them and sticking to how he was raised versus mm -hmm. helping these people and, like, sticking to the plan. Matthias is a liability. But, I mean, I'm sure Kaz has got backup plans about it. I like and that. Both of them trying to kill the dude is going to be a thing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Aaron, you haven't gone ahead? Predictions? No, I have not gone ahead. Uh, I I tend not to like predict too far ahead, otherwise I I kind of like you know I don't know like crazy, but basically put myself in that position where my uh, expectations don't get met. I just try to go in as blind as I can with little to no expe expectations, so I can always be surprised. Okay, I like that. Um, one yeah. other person. Oh, Michelle hasn't gone ahead. Predictions, Michelle. I think it's going to go terribly wrong. I don't know how. It just feels like it's going to go bad. The calm before the storm. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Jimmy, yeah. you keep trying to say something. What's up? Yeah, I just wanted to tell you this great quote. I believe it is uh, in a certain beginning part of the book, but it's like the water hears and understands the ice does not forgive. I was like, that's pretty, pretty cool. So that's a Fjordan sort of like saying, and uh, Matthias started saying that, and Nina in Fjordish actually finishes that. So she's saying, I understand you. And it's like so interesting to see the perspectives on it because like Nina learnt Fjordan so she wouldn't fear the enemy. So if anything went down, she was actually able to handle herself in the situation. And his take on that when she speaks Fjordan is, Fjordish, is of course you're a spy. That's why you know you're a dangerous spy. And it's just like, oh, my God, she's scared of you. You're scared of her. You're both trying to live in this scenario. I just think that's really fascinating. King of Scars is the next book after Six of Crows. People have already either bought it or they're already onto it. I have also bought it, so I think that I'll probably be wanting to read this one after we cover Six of Crows. But just so you know as well, we're going to do every month we'll cover – this is why YA is probably a little bit better for it. We're going to cover one book every two weeks. So every single month, the first two books, we're going to be covering a YA book. We're going to have a week off so that we can read the nerdist book and have like discussions with that. Um, we might just have a general discussion on here, like just talking about other book recommendations and things like that. Um, or we just have the week off so that we can get stuck into the nerdist book. And then that uh, last week of the month, we do nerdist book club and then we do the after show uh, right there on the Geek Bomb Discord, which is a paid privilege, I'm, I am afraid. Um, but if anyone wants to watch it and chat on twitch that is completely open but we do have like a book club community that is happening nick swing talk me through this that you just wrote uh so it's crooked kingdom a few people will correct it uh that's crooked kingdom that's next after six of crows which is the second in the duology oh, yeah, that is the crows yeah. duology and then we go on to the nikolai duology which is king of scars <laughs> no more <laughs> No more. You got it wrong. No. Okay. I bought them all. I think. I think. I went on a, I, you know, yeah, I'll buy three more credits. Um, all right. So we're on Six of Crows. Then it's Crooked Kingdom. Then Nikolai's series is King of uh, Scars and then Rule of Wolves. Aaron's got them yes, all on. I believe there's a year gap between Crooked Kingdom and King of Scars. Who has read yeah, all of them? Who's read all of them? Kat, Kat, you've read all of them? Yes. I'm going to be mean. Can you rank them? Which one's the best to worst uh, out of all so of them? It's, it's really hard to say. All I can say is that each book just keeps getting better and better. So I guess, you know, Shadow and Bone would be the bottom and then Wolves would be the best and everything in between in order, I guess. But I would say the Crooked Kingdom duology and the king of scars du duology are like both very very good does the king of scars does it flip the genre again does she completely shake it up even i'm so excited to read them all i think uh, I've... it's it's still pretty familiar mm -hmm. um I, I wouldn't say it's as big of a, a shift than from what we want with shadow and bone to um Six of Crows. Okay, okay. I think i got to get my mum onto this series. It's just what we do. Um, Thierry's like, listen, I'm still waiting for Dresden Files. Look, I started that obsession, so I feel completely responsible for that. But just a reminder that we actually did, I think it was last year, we did cover Stormfront and Full Moon, so we would start Grave Peril if we were to. I'm not sure if it'll happen on Nerdist, I've been trying for a while. It is a smaller book, so it has a little bit more of a chance now that we're covering one a month. Um, but at the same time, it's a long series. I think that one might be a little bit better for Geek Bomb. Um, and starting, like, trying to convince Nerdist to start at book three might be a little bit tricky as well. So maybe I can make dresden's home here on geek bomb that could be good because i'm like i'm already like two-fifths through grave peril as well so i can start that again but that means that we can get through like the entire series we'd have to dedicate like 
a year to it, but like, <laughs> why not? Right? Right? Um, yeah, Audible. Would you like to buy three more credits? Says Chris. Very dangerous words. Spend $25 and get $5. Oh, yeah. This is the thing. Like I, if we have an off week, I would love to talk about like the books, the best books you've read and what we collectively have in our still to read pile of shame. I don't know if I'm going to call it pile of shame because we'll get there. We'll get there. Chris, Dresden reread. I'm in. Seriously. We could do a book a week. We could do like, all right, first week, grave peril, second week, this, like, you can get through a Dresden book a week. Yeah. Ivare, I'm in the middle of Grave Peril also. Well, stop there because we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. Get onto Six of Crows immediately. Swap them out. Swap them out. That's how this is going. Maud tells you what to read now. Uh, while we've got 10 minutes left, everyone get your recommendations in when your to, to be red pile is 500 deep. Uh, yeah. And I can't keep buying them because, like, if I ever move home, I don't want to take 19 suitcases of books with me. That's why I like Audible as well. Here we go. The One Dime Bowl Baggin by Baggin. <laughs> Has anyone read the Black Company series by Glenn Cook? Chat? No one? No. Okay. There you go. None of us. And there's how many do we have here? We've got like 12 people in the, in the on comms, as we say. STS, I'll always recommend the original Thrawn trilogy. Are we talking non-canon? Are we talking Tim? What's his name? Oh, I have the Thrawn book that came out canon. It must be in my other bookcase or behind. Where are you? Behind. Other one. Mm. Um, Legends. Okay, I never read them, so that could be a good one as well. Has anyone read the original Thrawn trilogy? Anyone? Chat? Killer? Is this on? Okay, no one has? No. no. Chris has? Alrighty. I can't wait to read Ninth House by Bardugo because she was actually in a secret society at Yale. Oh, what? Uh, Chris read it long ago. Next Wing wants to read Thrawn. Okay. Aaron, your recommendations are The Dead Witch Walking and The Bartimus Trilogy. Uh, I had heard about your recommendation for The Dead Witch Walking so many times that I saw it was on sale, so I bought it and then realized I had already bought it. I had two different versions of it. Apparently they redid it with a different narrator. And I accidentally got it twice, so I had to get a refund for the second one. But, like, I've been hearing you loud and clear on that one. Um, everyone's typing in the comments, but unmute and tell me. We can go in order with Lisa. What's your recommendation? Uh, what, what, what? Uh, I really would like to read some Brandon Henderson books with you guys because I think we could have some really good discussions on them. Uh, I'm about to finish the first Mistborn. So that's a yes from me and sooner than later while it's fresh in my mind because I tried reading that book twice <laughs> and I finally got there. So that, yeah, maybe we have to do Six of Crows, second book, Crooked Kingdom, and then we could do Mistborn and then we could do King of Scars and then we can do all the Dresden books. See what's happening? See what's happening? Too many books and not enough time. Uh, next, Adam, do you want to recommend the Body Trilogy? Sell it to oh, me. Oh, yeah, no, this is something that me and Aaron have mentioned, like, for a couple of months of book clubs. Sell it to me. Oh, man, it's been such a long time. It's, it's, um, uh, in, the, I believe it's in the UK. It's in the UK, um, kind of like a wizard majocracy kind of thing where they summon, um, Jin. Oh. as their servants and it kind of explores a majocracy with jinn versus people that don't have powers and oh, wow. tackles um owning jinn and Argent people or you know that kind of thing there i love it um aaron said think reverse harry potter and i was like man that sounds cool all righty um michelle you have a terry pratchett book or series Uh, yeah, the Tiffany Aching books, they're sort of, uh, I think they're like technically YA. Um, I think it's a little bit, uh, 
you know, they can kind of, it might be a little bit children's books, but um, it's just coming of age of a witch in the disc world. And um, if you've ever read the disc world books, but it's sort of less satire, more fantasy. Okay. But I think they're just really great. I like, I like. Uh, Ivare has says, have you read the two books by Hank Green? Uh, they are Fulton Star, Fulton, this, Fulton Now Stars and what's the second one? Anyone? Hank Green has written two books. Fulton Now Star, John Green. Nope. Then who's Hank Green? Ivare, help me out there. I saw Green. No, not that. It's the other Green. <laughs> what are the two Green books? Hank Green. An absolutely remarkable thing and a beautifully foolish endeavor. No, I haven't read either of those. Both the brothers are just bumping out books like that. One of them got made into, or both of them got made by John Green. They got made into movies, didn't they? That's an overachieving family. Good on them. Good on them. Both really great books. Two movies and a TV show. My God. Talk about getting the green. That's cool. Maud could write a book. No, she couldn't. Maud does not like writing. Maud likes speaking. There is a big difference. Uh, we've got the Devabad, Devabad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty. Gosh, please tell me I've done that right. Devabad trilogy. Has anyone read that one? The Devabad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty? I have. They're very good. Yeah? Cats read them. Hell yeah. yeah. Okay. Zillanux, thank you, A, for the recent follow, and B, for the rec. Recommendation. Cool, cool. Um, I have to scroll up. Who else had a recommendation? Uh, Nick Swing, you had one. Uh, so for Nerds Book Club a while ago, there was uh, American Gods. I recommend Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. It is so much smaller, so much more digestible, so much more of a linear story. Um, it's his more dark fantasy type where this guy is going back to an old childhood home that he lived in for a few years. And as he gets there, he remembers this whole magical journey that he had as a child that he had completely forgotten. And it's wonderful. And Neil Gaiman beautifully writes from the perspective of a child. And it's done very, very well. And oh, it's that. small and digestible that would be good for Geek Bomb. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Chris, you do you want to sell me on Mistborn? Even though I'm reading the first book. But you said Mistborn second trilogy is 2 ED, second edition. Is there a second edition? What is that? Chris, are you there? There are two eras. What? Since when? So far. Oh, okay, what are they? <laughs> Lisa, do you want to jump on and tell me? I know that Chris is more of a fan of writing. Unless, Chris, is this your time? There are two trilogies. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so I haven't read the second era yet, but I heard that one's more of kind of like a Western-based fantasy hmm. um like cowboy kind of <laughs> um okay. but I, haven't, I haven't read that one yet but yeah i think there's supposed to be a total of four different eras of miss Warren. i know he's actually writing the first book of era three right now whoa okay huh cool uh yeah i could probably do a children's book terry not bad uh thanks for the recommendation chris i'm kind of already doing it so that's good Keeper of Ancient Wisdom, I know you said that some people are at your place so you couldn't talk anymore, but on the off chance that you can, do you want to recommend the Rebecca Roanhorse book? Oh, she's not here. There you go. Rebecca Roanhorse books, but she hasn't finished either series. Yeah, I get that. The burnout's real. Um, Thierry, do you want to jump on and talk about the book you wanted to recommend? Earth Children's Earth's Children series by Jean M. Oyel. I'm guessing maybe French. Jean M. Oyel. And uh, Jean M. Oyel, uh, she's a uh, French author. She wrote uh, yeah, a series of, I think, uh, 
uh, in the uh, Ice Age. And uh, yeah, I, wrote, I read this in high school. It's a, there are some racing moments, but overall the story is pretty good. Like, I'm in! She, <laughs> she followed uh, archaeologists to make sure that uh, the technology used by uh, Neandert Neandertals and cavemen were accurate in her book. Yeah, so she studied with them. Wow, that's and fascinating. To dig sites also. Oh, so wow. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And another one that I've read, uh, Artemis by this, I forget this. You've been saying this name, one. The same as uh, okay, get it. Uh, The Martian. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if I got it. Um, Michelle, Tamora Pierce, talk to me about that. Uh, sure. So she did the Linus Quartet and the Immortals and a bunch of others, but it's basically sort of prototypical fantasy land, um, but female leads. And one, there are two series about knights, one about a druid, um, and then another about um, sort of a fighter character who's in like the City Watch, um, but they're all. all YA, short, easy, um, and just how many? Like, sort of one of those books you read as a. I mean, well, so they're. I think they're all uh, quartets. So there's four in each series, except for <laughs> so many one, books. which is a trilogy. Got it. Okay, cool. That's a that's another year sorted. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we would have to do all of them. I think we could just pick probably the Linus Quartet. I think that's the one that everyone reads. Okay. But the Immortals is my favorite, which is about the Druid. Oh, there's Andy Wee one. Jimmy, you have one recommendation? Yes, I have a recommendation. Now, it's called Encyclopedia Brown. Now, if you like stuff like um, a Jenny LeClue or, you know, stuff like that, like it's like a child solving everyday crimes, uh, you know, uh, it's – 28 novels thick so i don't know if you're gonna want to read all 28 of them Goodness. but if this is definitely like an iconic uh series i think you know, i don't know if it kicked off the detective thing but it's definitely been around for a while and uh you know, i think it's very delightful and it's I, very palatable because again the main character is a child mm -hmm. sts says how many books are in the drizzt series by r.s salvatore or salvatore um, I started re-listening to the, well, I read, I, I started the series over 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. And I think I got through like the first seven or nine books. Uh, and I remember liking them a lot, especially with the D and D. So I bought the first three again on Audible. I don't love the narrator. Um, Brain Beast Studios from Brizzy says, I grew up reading those. Yeah, I think we all went through like a bit of a phase um, before I even knew they were D&D. &D. Same. I think I was getting into D&D &D and my brother had read them all and he was playing D&D &D and he's like, if you like that, if you want to get into D&D, &D, read this, see if you like it. And we've always loved fantasy. My brother is writing a fantasy book at the moment. Um, I was actually supposed to help him this afternoon with it, but we're doing this sort of book club. Uh, so I'll have to do that afterwards. But there's 36 STS, there's 36 books. So I'm on book number two. <laughs> I read the first one, listened to it. Uh, because the narrator is predictable with his cadence, I started listening to it before I went to bed to put me to sleep. And that's not how I want to enjoy the series. But there's 36. So I don't know. I mean, I am reading them. So we could get started on those. <laughs> But that's three years. <laughs> that's three years of books. Yikes. Um, uh, Kate, you had King of the Wild. Tell me about that. Kings of the Wild. It's a D&D book, essentially, without being D&D. Like, Tell me it's more. very thinly veiled to not be sued for copyright. <laughs> so it's like retired adventurers getting their party back together for one more adventure. And just kind of, it's like a comedy sort of fantasy where, you know, all the things about them being like old adventurers come into play too. But it's just, it's really good. Okay. We're going to have to put these in a document. I'm going to actually open a doc, a Google doc of recommendations, and I'm going to make it public so that everyone in 
uh, Geek Bombs Discord and the Patreon section here can add these books and then like a little blurb or a synopsis and like if it's a long book or a short book or whatever, but we can like really build out this incredible yeah, recommendation. It, it is, Knox, Knox said it, it is red meets d &D. Dang, that's really cool. Okay, this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'll start that document straight after this. Okay, I shall add to this doc, says Chris. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I've still got some of my recommendations. I'll put them on there as well. But if we want to put everyone's name and then like a bullet point of like the recommendations as well, but I really would like a synopsis for the author, the book title, all that fun stuff. We can make it happen. Um, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, tell me if it's like a, an easy read, like a – light read or a quick read or if it's a thick boy uh that would be really cool uh keeper of ancient wisdom we lost you for a bit there we're doing book recommendations did you want to pitch me a series that we could cover in a future episode if you're able to talk oh we lost them again that's okay that's okay uh, i'll start this doc that's going to be a lot of fun we've definitely hit the two hour mark with this one here. oh there you go again hey are you there? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Do you have a book, a series or a book to recommend for book club? Um, I've been reading um, Rebecca Roanhorse. She is a Native American writer. Oh, wow. And um, she has one series that takes place on a, a post-apocalyptic Navajo reservation. And, oh, wow. And um, they use uh, the monsters and legends uh from navajo lore are part of it um the other series uh i read was black sun which is takes place uh, it's kind of dark fantasy mm -hmm. and it takes place in a pre-columbian central american type uh, wow. civilization um the only problem is She's got two books in the first trilogy and only Black Sun in the second. So I don't know when the others are coming out. But uh, Black Sun, I would especially recommend. Um, the um, um, Trail of Lightning, I think, is the first in the other series. And I really liked it because I have Navajo family members that know something about the lore. Cool. But I don't know um how much everybody else would be into it but i really liked it okay all right so i'm going to start this document this is going to be really cool we'll pin it in hashtag reading in that section of geek bombs discord uh thank you to everyone joining for the like the, the first revamped i think this is the third iteration of geek bomb book club that i've done in the last seven years so i love this little community thank you so much for joining me for this your homework is to finish the book, finish Six of Crows. Uh, we'll get through all of those. Alan O. Allen says, in terms of D&D &D books, the Dark Sun books are really interesting, starting with the Verdant Passage. I'm pretty sure someone said that in the chat as well. If not, we're getting it happening. Um, but we're wrapping things up here. Uh, while we do that, a big thank you to Jablink for subscribing for their ninth month at Tier 2 with me as the uh, emote for that one. Uh, we are going to guide the raid thanks to STS, which is really cool. Borderline Entertainment followed just this minute. Thank you so much. Um, oh, we've had another guide the raid. Two people have spent on guide the raid. Hmm, what to do? Had to pop my suggestion in. <laughs> uh, the Gooza, thank you so much for the follow. Get rectified, Joe Moms. Joe Moms. Uh, Annette Nom, Annette Nom, Will Knight, uh, thank you so much for the follows that happened throughout this. We've got to flip a coin. I'll, I'll drop by Not Sage. Everyone tell, um, tell Sage that Maud says hi. Uh, Jasper's Game Week is live for Australia right now too, says Brain Bee Studios. That's awesome. Um, so just if, if anyone doesn't know what happens with, uh, guide the raid, you can spend 300, 3000 channel points and tell me who that we, who we raid into. Not Sage is just chatting at the moment. Actually, I'm going to do it to whoever has the least amount of followers. Adam Vision's got less. Just Sage has over 200 and Adam Vision's got 159. I want to help the smaller audiences get bigger. 
Um, so we're going to go with Adam Vision, if that's the case. So go drop by to Adam Vision, say a big hello from me. Um, drop some mod squads in the chat as well. We're going to get this document happening. Everyone's going to put in their recommendations, which is really cool. STS, I hope that's okay that I did that. But yeah, if there's a fight between two, I'm going to I'm going to support the smaller who needs a little nudge. But also go drop by Not Sage's um, stream as well and tell him says hi too. Share that love. We're going to go raid. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>